Nintendo, Sega, and Namco unite to save the arcade. Sony and Microsoft get sued over controllers. And EverQuest goes premium. These stories and many, many more on this episode of the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine. I've been waiting a long time for a chance to say this. Stop the presses. Requiescat in pace. Make some crazy money. What is a man? It's me, Mario. What a mess. Get over here! Please save me. Welcome back to the Video Game Newsroom Time Machine, the show where we travel back in time to find out what was making headlines in the home computer and video game industries of yesteryear. Today we're going to be traveling back 20 years to April of 2002. I'm your host, Carl, and I'm joined again by our co-host, Wouter. Welcome back to the show, Wouter. Hi. We were talking about this before the show started. You have been doing some light reading. Right, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I listened to another Dutch podcast, which is called uh, Retro Papa, and uh, it's all about retro games as well. And uh, this writer was on the show, Ronald Meus, and he uh, wrote a book about the 50, or it's called 50 games die je gespeeld moet hebben, and that's translated to the 50 games you must have played. Yes, so <laughs> not a pretentious title at all, because, I mean, uh, we have a history here on this show of going after books that have pretentious titles. <laughs> but uh, he, he clearly says, and also in the book itself, it's his opinion. So it's really, uh, he, he also has some really weird titles in there. Uh, maybe just to be different or something than, than mm. other titles in the, on, on the web. You can also find uh, these kind of websites with, which uh, list all kinds of games you have to play. So, uh, but uh, it's an interesting book. It's really light. It's like two pages per game and uh, a little bit of history about about the game and uh, and that's it. It's a nice uh, nice uh, uh, book you can read on the toilet or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one, one game and then uh, then you're done with your business. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Now it does make a few interesting choices. Like uh, of all the Cinemaware games he could have chosen, he chooses Rocket Ranger as opposed to It Came from the Desert, which I simply don't understand. But oh well. <laughs> uh, and he also chose Zach McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders over Maniac Mansion or Monkey Island. Is Monkey Island in there? No. no. Uh, oh, I think, I think when he he, he, sa- he talks about uh, Zach McCracken he notices it, it, but maybe he chose this because it's sort of thing. It's the weirder. It is definitely <laughs> the weirder. One. Maybe, maybe maybe it's that. And uh, yeah. And also I got an Xbox 360 for free this week. Uh, <laughs> so, some, some, someone uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, threw away their Nintendo, they said. So actually wow. it, it came from uh, from uh, a co-worker from uh, my wife and she said to my wife yeah uh, maybe your kids want to have my old Nintendo so uh, she said it turned out to be a 360 <laughs> so she said yeah yeah it's okay yeah, uh, bring it to me and then uh, it was an Xbox 360 but I, I never had an Xbox in my life so this is my first oh, really? Xbox and that book has some Xbox titles uh, like um, Gears of War is in there Halo 3 mm. is in there Batman mm. Arkham Asylum oh yeah that's uh, cool. Mass Effect too. Those those are in there, and uh, I immediately ordered them for like two euros uh, a game or something. It's okay. crazy cheap. One thing, one thing. Before you play Mass Effect Two, you have to play Mass Effect One <laughs> because you can carry over your character, and the decisions you make in the game actually influence how the story progresses in all three games. Hmm. So, it's, so it's yeah, like start with the first, and uh, yeah, yeah. you have to play the trilogy all the way through and play and, and use the save game. So play them on the same platform. Hmm. I don't know if I have time for that. But, uh, oh, come <laughs> we'll on. What's another 200 hours of your life? Come on. I play short games mostly. So, uh... oh, But Mass Effect, trust Mass Effect. I mean, the game, uh, the book also listed things like uh, Knights of the Old Republic. Yeah, I've played that and one. And the Mass Effect trilogy is a true spiritual sequel to oh. Knights of the Old Republic. It's yeah. what you would have gotten as a true sequel to Knights of the Old Republic had it just had Star Wars. Okay. So, yeah. 
yeah, I don't have a lot of interest in Star Wars, so for me it's okay to have another Yeah, I'm universe. talking about the game mechanic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, sure. But then, uh, then uh, I, I'm stuff. not disappointed that it doesn't have a Star Wars license anymore. That's true. Okay, so you've got your read taken uh, care of. We have a ton of stuff to get through. Uh, remember, everybody, uh, you can follow us on the Twitters and all that good stuff. Also, we're recording this on the 30th of May. Uh, yesterday, or earlier today, I posted a brand new uh, interview episode up on our Patreon. So one of the old episodes that's been sitting there on the Patreon has now moved to the main feed. Uh, you can uh, check that out. One of the co-founders of New World Computing. And the new one that is up for all of those Commodore heads out there who I know are listening to this show, my interview, it's the first of two Commodore-related interviews that are going to be coming down the pipeline, is with Don Greenbaum, the former treasurer of Commodore, and before that, Commodore's bank a banker. So if you want to find out how Commodore really managed to get into the computer business and how they were able to go mass market and what that really meant on the inside, all the way up through Jack Trammell leaving and the acquisition of Com of the Amiga, and for Argentine listeners out there, a little bit about how the Drian Comodore 64 came about, check out uh, that interview. It's up right now on the Patreon and will be there for at three months exclusively. So for a buck, you can come in and enjoy that. Okay, uh, that's enough plug. All the links in the show notes below. Now we have to do the first of our mandatory segments. Uh, mandatory, yeah, not really mandatory. We do it because it's fun. And that is our segment, The Seven Minutes in Heaven, where the co-host of the show must play one of the games that was reviewed in a publication dated April 2002. And remember, for our purposes of this show, all dates that we talk about when dealing with Jump are uh, dates related to cover dates of Megan's and newspapers. So, of course, news happened it's for that. But we had many games to choose from this month, uh, many of them for the Game Boy Advance, which is still really grabbing its feet in uh, early 2002. And we narrowed it down to a choice between two fighting franchise titans, Mortal Kombat Anthology on the Game Boy Advance, or Tekken Advance. And, Vouter, which one did you choose? I, I choose Tekken, because that's the one I don't know anything about, and Mortal Kombat is a game I played a lot, and maybe it was a little bit more interesting to see me play Tekken. <laughs> I'm not a real fighting game guy, so... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting watch, uh, probably. <laughs> well, uh, I'm just going to put this out there. You got lucky because Mortal Kombat Anthology on the Game Boy Advance is truly considered one of the worst commercial releases <laughs> of all time. Ooh, but I don't there. <laughs> so, uh, are you ready to jump into Tekken Advance? Yeah. Cool. Then let's get it on. Welcome back. So, for the uninitiated, describe Tekken Advance based off of your seven minutes with the game. Uh, Tekken is a, a fighting game, a one-on-one -on -one fighting game. Uh, probably a lot of people know. But the thing of it is that it's a, a sort of 3D arena, arena uh, where you can spin around each other. And um, in the Game Boy version, it's not that 3D. It's all sprites and some scaling effects, but it's pretty convincing. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really really a fighting guy so mm. I was just mashing buttons so I don't know if there's any tactics but uh, I got like 8 minutes in and then uh, then I uh, got a game over screen so uh, yeah I was pretty, uh, doing pretty well by just mashing buttons <laughs> <laughs> but yeah uh, great looking game, great sounding game uh, I'm glad I picked this one uh, over uh, Mortal Kombat <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're, you're definitely lucky because yeah Mortal Kombat got basically trapped 
crashed in all the reviews and this base uh, almost got straight, you know, top tier rating because everybody uh, really did think that it was an amazing uh, conversion. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah, for, for our Game Boy Advance, it's a really nice graphic. So, uh, yeah, I'm considering to get it uh, for my collection. But uh, one thing which is unfortunate that you need two cartridges to play a multiplayer. Uh, yeah. I don't think a lot of people did that uh, back in the day. No, I doubt. I, I doubt that. Uh, I mean, this was also one of those games that was a PlayStation. Uh, it was a standard PlayStation game. Uh, the original Tekken was one of, if if not in the launch window, was one of the launch titles uh, for the system. Uh, the arcade board that Tekken 1, uh, 2, and I think even 3 ran off of were based off PlayStation hardware. So it really was a system, a game that was built for that system. So I can imagine that there were some Game Boy Advance players who didn't have the connection with the franchise that oh. was necessary to really propel it forward. True, but, yeah. uh, uh, Maybe a lot of PlayStation players don't have a Game Boy. Yeah, I mean, it was a game that I think really was targeting a slightly older audience, and the Game Boy Advance, especially in this early, early phase, I mean, in North America and Europe, the Game Boy Advance has je- just launched for the previous Christmas. So we aren't talking about a system that's been around for forever. Mm-hmm. It's relatively early in the system's life and uh, those early adopters may not be the hardcore that, they may not be the hardcore that this game was targeting. Yeah, you know. there's probably a lot of Nintendo fans who own these things now. And yeah. Because so, I was, I think, 18 when I, or 17 when I bought my Game Boy Advance, so I should be the target audience back in the day. But, uh, yeah, but when did you buy it? Which year? Mm, I don't know, but it was an SP, so it was later. Oh, later. yeah. Yeah, by then this game would have been out of print, so you would have had to find a used cop something. Yeah, then I think I already have a hard uh, uh, I think it's hard uh, to find game because it's also yeah, maybe more marketed well. to the US, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, maybe, but I just don't think it's sold in in such large numbers. It, yeah, I just it's don't unfortunate so. because it looks great, especially for such mm-hmm. an early title. Yeah. Now, I don't know how well it would have read on an original GBA screen. That's true. Yeah. That that might be the one downside to it because it has a relatively high level of detail and it's using these zoomed in sprites. It's very possible that it was hard to read on actual Ooh. screen at the yeah, time. Yeah, it would be one blur. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And, but it amazes me that it actually, it looks like it's made for, uh, for backlit models because it's not that overly bright. Uh, stuff you see in the early titles of the GBA because they they, they compensate uh, the colors because because the Game Boy Advance didn't have a backlight so yeah. you have really like the, the gaudy uh, bright colors and uh, just to make it more readable but in, indeed this game didn't have it so and that may have just been inexperienced uh, on the part of the developers oh, yeah that could be true because I don't know how many games they Namco uh, published at that time for even if mm-hmm. even if they had been publishing for a while, it wouldn't have been more than one or two titles released up to this point. Probably a Mr. Trader or something like yeah. that. And that is already really bright and colorful, so they, exactly. they couldn't have uh, get the lessons from there. Hmm, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But for now, uh, yeah, um, I think uh, if you're a Game Boy Advance gamer, uh, I should definitely check it out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, it is probably one of those hidden gem library. Uh, mm. Now, obviously, neither Either one of us is hardcore Tekken people, so how well it translates the mechanics of the original game, that's something that somebody else would have to tell us. You know, leave a comment uh, while you're giving us a thumbs up or the five <laughs> stars or whatever. Let us know, you know, if we uh, if we really should uh, be talking to better, uh, more in-depth Tekken experts. Yeah, ourselves. but the moves, move list on, on game facts was really long, so there is a lot of techniques in there, but uh, I don't know if it, uh, it's the same as the, the originals, but uh, yeah, we'll, I, I'll gladly hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. Uh, one more stop before we turn on the time machine. We have to check in with our good friend Ethan to find out what I got wrong in our last 20 year jump in a little segment we call the Department of Corrections. Hello. This is a prepaid collect call from the Department of Corrections. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. To accept charges, press. One. You may start the conversation now. 
Welcome back. So, let's get started with... The Department of Correction. With Here I was addendum. setting you up for the mad cop. With addendum. <laughs> the mad comment. I feel like we need a sound effect at this point. Yeah, but then really again, you, you, you keep trading co-hosts, so maybe it wouldn't yeah, be good. Yeah. But, Mad, I just want to tell you, you're 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 always going to be an OBE in my heart. <laughs> Yeah, he'll he'll be very happy to hear that or yes. something. Th- 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 thank you, Mad, for your for your service to a country that you do not come from. Thank you. The Retro Asylum is a UK national show. So <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, corrections time. Let's make it snappy. Okay, so you you put you put in the myth, the great myth, the myth that we have to stop saying that Street Fighter 2 reinvigorated the arcade market, which it did not. For the arcade market, in terms of revenue, video games was falling after 1989, I believe. Street Fighter 2 was a big game in a time when there hadn't been a big big game in a long time, but it did not reinvigorate anything. Okay, so it didn't act. So there's no actual uptick to the total revenue from that mark. No, it had, it had been in decline since 1989 and will continue to do so. 1995 is going to be, ooh, a real a real hit for you. You know, you'll cover it when you oh, get yeah. there. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, 1995 is basically when the when the video game arcade uh, becomes a minor mark after that. Uh, but yeah, Street there's a big myth that Street Fighter 2 was the last gasp for arcade, uh, and maybe it was the last big game in your area, but it was not the thing that made arcades truly special again. That was Double Dragon. True, true. Yeah, I, I always just think of it as the game that kicks off all of those one-on-one fighting games, which seemed to spread through the arcade. So it was like w- the last quote-unquote innovative genre that the arcades had. Which is fair enough, but that's different from saying that the arcades were big again for a moment because of Street Fighter 2. Street Fighter 2 sucked the air out of the room of other games. It did not bring entirely new business to the arcade. Gotcha. Next up, uh, the you were talking about the the redesign of the Xbox controller that was uh, launched in Japan. The smaller version of the controller was specifically made for the Japanese market. That's why. It was. Gotcha. And you uh, were wondering if it launched with it in Europe, and it did. The smaller version of the controller did launch with the original Xbox in Europe. So they did not launch with the proper controller. Yeah. So do, sad. Well, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot. I forgot you love it. Uh, yeah. I love okay. it, man. Yeah, you're. Maybe we should call you the Duke. See how you like it. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next on, we have Core Design. So Core Design was not exactly purchased by Ida. Core Design was purchased by U.S. Gold, which their par- the parent company is called Center Gold, in 1994. And then Eidos acquired Center Gold in 1996 to build out the Eidos apparatus. Okay, gotcha. That would happen. Okay, yeah. makes sense. But Eidos had nothing to do with the uh, with making Tomb Raider in terms of, uh, you know, spiriting it on. It, j- it just happened happened to fall in their lap like a couple months before they launched it uh so <laughs> that was yeah they, they they fell into success there and then they had no idea what to do after that oh they had an idea uh which <laughs> is uh grind grind the team into dust uh trying <laughs> to make sequ- uh not saying it was a good idea but they definitely had an idea there, there you go that's true that's true and now we say uh, bioware did not make all the games on the infinity end which is what you apply there were plenty of other uh people doing things so the black isle uh studio group within Interplay did stuff like Icewind Day and whatnot. Icewind Dale wasn't a Bioware? No, it was not Bioware. I can guarantee. Uh, oh, okay. For some reason, I thought it was Bioware. I no. knew uh, the uh, Planescape game uh, was Right. But I didn't know about... Uh, I, for some reason, I had Icewind Dale in the back of my head as Bioware. But no, that's, that, that rings true that they it wasn't. Yeah, they only did Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. Gotcha. And then they moved on to Never. Okay, and uh, then you were talking about PCs in the early 2000s. And you were talking about how people who were upgrading their PCs were, quote-unquote, a round error. And this is where I have to step in as somebody who grew up in the period, Carl. You know, I, I admit that I was not a typical user, but everybody that I, out of the people that I knew, I can tell you more than one in a hundred had some sort of upgrade that was in their PC that they bought, you know, originally as a Dell PC or whatever. They did upgrade at some, you know, originally it was probably a Windows 95 machine, you know, bought right around then, but they had upgrade. It is not a rounding error in terms of the percentage 
percentage of people who were had actually upgraded things in their uh okay uh, and here i'm going to simply say that as somebody who was adult in this period the sheer number of things like the e-machine or these standalone machines you could buy at a sam's club at the time were so numerous and the number of grandmas who suddenly had email accounts there is no way on god's green earth those people were buying upgrades and in compar- those upgrades in comparison with the revenue generated by the purchase of a brand new machine was a rounding error. Not, not after, you know, there was basically a, a price collapse after, uh, you know, like it right around when the, the dot com bubble burst. So actually, there wasn't a whole lot of revenue being generated off these extremely cheap machines. So oh, I would still not. contend no. that. Well, but still, a cheap machine was still a lot more than a graphics card back. This was the days before the graphics card was worth more than the rest of the PC, including the monitor like it is today. Uh, okay, I'm exaggerating, but uh, I mean, even if you bought a high-end video card back then, a 3D accelerator card, you weren't spending more than a couple hundred bucks. I'm just going to say that when you when said it, within a rounding error, which is like 999,999 out of 100,000, and you are absolutely wrong no, that, that no, was not no, a significant no, no, no. You are wrong. A rounding error is 5, 10 cent, up to 5 cent, depending on the, uh, the statistical variance that you're trying to you have a weird you have so many weird definitions you know so i'm not gonna say that it was 10 percent or something like that but you uh you know you you were underestimating that okay, okay. you know it becomes bigger you know and now now today i would say that it might be 10 percent of people who actually upgrade pretty regularly but yeah you're you all i know is that. all i know is the last time i actually upgraded my computer adding anything to it was in 99 i bought my first off the shelf machine in 2000 and haven't really not done that set just because didn't it, I became I was an adult <laughs> There's clearly a big market for it, Carl. Otherwise, why would we be complaining about not getting the, being able to get the graphics card? Come on. Oh, that's just because the idiots with their bitcoins that are now uh, dropping in price like they're not. Okay, but that's another issue entirely. Okay. <laughs> and on the subject of early PCs, I have played Deer Hunt. Indeed, I have. The, that was on, uh, I think, in uh, elementary school. That was yeah. uh, one of the things we had on our PCs. You said it was a still image. It's not just a still image. The deers actually move and stuff. True, in there. true. And it, it's a pretty cathartic like relaxing game you know I, I get why it had a kind of a broad up not oh, saying totally. it's good oh no no and the fact that it had a high a great appeal is totally understandable and yes I I I, I did go back and watch some video of the game after that episode and you are 100% correct by the by 2002 especially it was full 3D models and stuff it's I think it's the very very first version was still using scanned imagery so it felt a yeah, little bit there, more like there Mortal was an Kombat. image but, but the yeah. deers move, and that's yes. not just a still image. Quote. That's true. That's true. And uh, next on, uh, you uh, you were talking about your leisure suit, Larry things, uh, blah blah blah. Who cares? Uh, but you uh, were t- talking about something that you, you know one, one of the things that gr- visit the Great Tetons, and you're like, oh, it's nonsense. I must say, don't be dismissive of the Tetons. That's where my mom and dad met. Come on, the Teton Mountain. <sighs> Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. You're just setting me up for a really bad joke there. But mm. I wasn't being dismissive of the Tetons. What I was being dismissive of was the fact that the uh, ad, those those pack-in pamphlets that were in the VGA remake of Leisure Suit Larry 1, the original VGA remake, not the second re- uh, VGA remake of the game, were just there as a copy protection. They had no actual relevance to the game. It's not like they included an hints that would be relevant to Don't diss the they, Teton. Okay, no, no, last on... I, 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 I am a great lover. They're okay, beautiful. Okay, last novels. on the docket. <laughs> said that Rare hadn't really exploited their property uh, since they released them on the ZX Spectrum, but they did indeed do some stuff on the N64. Initially, Goldeneye was going to have a ZX Spectrum emulator inside of it. That didn't happen. Uh, but they in Donkey Kong 64, Jetpack is one of the necessary games that you have to play to get some of the extra coins and whatnot. So that's how I got exposed to the ZX Spectrum. Really? Now, but they're using the Donkey Kong 3D models for that, correct? No, or, it is oh, Jetpack. Spe- yes. Oh, really? It is a real Spectrum emulator inside oh, Donkey Kong 64. 
I did not know about that. I mean, the only reference I knew from that era was uh, Saber Wolf showing up as a character in Killer Instinct. He also shows up in uh, Don- in uh, Banjo Tooie. Oh, really? I did not know that either. Yeah. So that is cool. They, but uh, I mean, yeah. Prayer is a uh, company with so much lore, so much yeah. things that we need to mo- know more about. But that is a subject for another time. This is the Department of Corrections. We have corrected. We are closing the book. There is no lore, even though sometimes we put in. <laughs> and tea talk. Okay. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your service. And we will see you back here for the corrections for April of 1982. That's all right. See you. Bye. Interesting that um, Rare hit games in their N64 titles and, and never found them. But Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I, I never found any either. Granted, I never played a lot of N4. So. Me neither, yeah. Only the last three years or something, I got one. So <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's when I... Uh, but some some of those are pretty hard to get back to. But yeah, interesting, those uh, specy games. I, uh, uh, how how c- could you find those? That I don't know. That I'd have to look up. Uh, it's Maybe like probably... an action replay thing? or. I, I I don't know. Uh, honestly, uh, that's uh, beyond my grade. <laughs> so, well, pe- people can Google that. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Come on, that's what YouTube is for. <laughs> We're not here for those kind of things. But uh, uh, Jetpack, yeah. So, but you've played Jetpack recently, right? <laughs> yeah, only on game the remake on uh, Game Boy Color. Yeah, I, I think it's released one or two years ago. Mm-hmm. It's like a new game, a homebrew game, and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but I think. Uh, the original developer uh, uh, made it and put it in the fridge or something. It was never released, and he finished it like two years ago. And then uh, they they sort of published it as well. You could buy a box and uh, and the Game Boy, uh, the game itself. And it's, that's uh, pretty cool. It's, yeah, I think I, I don't know if there's any changes of the original. Maybe it's a little bit fancier, but uh, yeah, pretty cool game. I think. Yeah, uh, and Arcade rare. Style. I mean, rare like to use little tidbits bits i mean there's also that uh collection of mini game stuff celebrating rare's history that was released for the xbox 360 um or was it 360 oh, or yeah the xbox, uh, xbox uh, one because i got the xbox 360 one. i thought oh no i can get that rare uh, uh <laughs> retro collection and i just looked it up and, and i found out it was xbox one so uh, ah, i have to get a, another nintendo uh in about 10 years and then, uh, <laughs> then i can play that gotcha okay uh, then let's turn on the time machine. It is time to head back to April of 2002. I think this guy's going to 2002. Demographic Marsh Welcome to April of 2002. Wouter, what's our first story? Triforce gives arcades a glimmer of hope. The annual AOU arcade show in Tokyo was a pale shadow of its former self. The big news was the partnership between Sega, Namco, and Nintendo to launch the Triforce, a GameCube-based arcade hardware. This follows the announcement we covered in our December 2001 jump that Sega was launching an Xbox-based arcade hardware as well known as Chihiro. No titles were ready for a show. Besides Triforce, the few highlights of the show included Soul Calibur 2, Metal Slug 4, and Guilty Gear XX. Triforce is an interesting uh, machine. I've never seen it uh, in uh, in the arcades, but I really wanted to because like F-Zero GX is one of my favorite games ever, and there's an AX arcade version, and I think that's on Triforce uh, arcade uh, hardware. And yes, I uh, wish there's that, and there's also also a, an arcade version of Super Mario Kart uh, also on that hardware and a few others. So yeah, I mean the Triforce hardware, I've played the Mario Kart game. It is really, really smooth. It's a really, really nice playing version of Mario Kart. It's a really and... bizarre version as well because it's made by Nemco if I remember <laughs> correctly, with Pac-Man in there as, as well. Well, you'd be surprised how many Nintendo character-based games are actually developed by third party yeah there's a like lot i said f-zero is made by sega yeah so <laughs> that's actually the, in my opinion the best sega game ever but <laughs> <laughs> oh dude them fight words them fight words <laughs> yeah, you do just, not want to tweet... say that when the earshot of a shenmue fan uh you do not want to he- say that in the earshot of a golden axe fan you do not uh, we don't even want to talk about the sonic the hedgehog uh, crazy <laughs> I, I, I didn't even get any re- response on my twitter so uh <laughs> 
<laughs> Everybody <laughs> send your hate like mail <laughs> to Weedo at Twitter. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, uh, the arcades are really, really hurting at this point, and there's really no end to the bleeding side of it. It's really important because, like I said, because of this, I never seen the, those uh, arcade cabinets because probably they didn't sell well. Or no, like the AX machine, it was really uh, interesting because you could uh, get your save game from the your F Zero GX, uh, like the the memory card. You can bring it yeah. to the arcade and put it in that machine there and get special content for uh, for your GameCube game uh, if you put it in the arcade machine and stuff like that. It's pretty interesting to like, um, yeah, they connect home with arcade or something. They, they try, they, they they tried stuff, but they uh, try, they, <laughs> they try. try. <laughs> yeah, uh, Sega around this time is also going to start introducing systems where you have uh, where you have little credit card uh, credit cards for specific games that have your saved game on them. Uh, I still have mine for uh, what was it called Ghost Squad. That's a few years out still, but yeah, I mean, th- there's going to be attempts to try to liven up the arcade, but sadly, the arcade experience is on the decline, and the fact that the home hardware is so good, and the fact that the arcade hardware is basically just the home hardware at this point. I mean, the Triforce is a GameCube, Chihiro is a Xbox. There's really not a lot of incentive, or at least there's not a lot of, you know, shock and awe when you're going to the arcade, except maybe some weird controllers, but yeah. a lot of those experiments are failing, as we've talked about in previous episodes. It's unfortunate, but yeah, if there is no business, then uh, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, the, that's the market, unfortunately. Mm. But hey, the rest of gaming is looking bright. <laughs> 2001, best year ever for gaming. After a lackluster 2000, 2001 knocked down all previous year's record, re- reading an all-time high for U.S. sales of video games and hardware of $9.4 billion, that's with a B, dwarving the previous high set in 1999 of $6.9 billion. A huge chunk of that was due to the launch of Xbox and GameCube, as well as mass adoption of the PS2 and Game Boy Advance, and aided by mega-hit GTA 3, which moved more than 2 million units in just the last three months of the year. I think especially that latter one uh, <laughs> did, did well, because I can't remember Xbox and GameCube doing that great. Uh, they still sold a lot, and they were very... Yeah, and, so and especially the Xbox here. was an expensive. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, if you're moving 100,000 Xboxes at $300 a pop, you can do the math. You're at, you know, $30 million bucks just on that console as far as revenue mm. goes. Yeah, and uh, it, it's growing, like, to be the biggest industry uh, in the world, I think, at this point. Well, now, 20 years later, it's... N- and no, it's nowhere near the biggest industry. In the world. Pff, car manufacturing alone Let's is say, multiple. Entertainment in industry. <laughs> uh, entertainment, you still have to take with a grain of salt because video games are always being compared with box office as opposed to streaming services plus box office plus DVD sales, which have been declined, oh. plus TV rights, which have also been declined and so on and so forth. So, I mean, yeah, video it's games... It's measure, maybe. It's, it's hard to measure TV. Uh, well, no, it's not hard to measure TV. You know how much the TV station is making off of advertising. True. And you know how much money people are paying for cable bill, for cable television or satellite True. television. So you you can quantify how much money movies and television generate. But nowadays, the difficult part nowadays is distinguishing between movies and television because you can't really distinguish between the two. Mm. You kind of have to throw them all into one lump. Yeah, and like television is already like every series, every episode of a series like a, like a movie. So Yeah, when you look at the budget, yeah, it's insane. And the production values, everything has evolved. But then again, gaming today, I mean, we wouldn't even think twice about 9.4 billion industry. <laughs> no. So, I mean, yeah. And one interesting little stat that was also here in these news stories about these numbers, just to put into perspective the difference between the PC world and the console world, The Sims, which is the most successful PC game, 
game of all time, has finally managed to crack 2.6 million units sold since launch. Hmm. And uh, GTA 3 uh, moved three, 2 million already. In three months in three on months. one platform. Hmm. It's still going to come out on the Xbox. Crazy. Yes. Uh, I, I, Sims was everywhere at the time, what I remember. So yeah, And also G- like GTA 3 that. as well, but <laughs> I don't know. Sims was like, yeah, everybody and your mom was playing it. Well, that's the thing. The, the Sims, uh, obviously Pirates plays a role in this, but the PC game market just isn't as big as the console game market. Oh. Yeah, But, oh well. Okay, but not everything is rosy. Sony and Microsoft sued over controller patents. Immersion Corporation, an American maker of force feedback technology, has sued both Microsoft and Sony for their use of what Immersion claims is infringing force feedback tech in their console controller. Microsoft will ultimately settle with Immersion and even buy 10% of the company, while Sony will fight the case until 2007 and settle with Immersion, having lost at trial and several appeals and having removed force feedback from the PS3 controller. Yeah, I remember getting my PS3 and without it was suddenly we didn't have Rumble anymore because and I was used to the GameCube controller with Rumble uh, and really good Rumble as well. So how did uh, Nintendo do that? Because Well, uh, Ninten- I don't know if Nintendo was uh, using a different technology mm. or had actually paid a lice fee. I don't know that, but the uh, the technology that Sony and Microsoft were both using both infringed on uh, this patent. Oh, okay, and is this patent still a thing? Uh, oh, uh, that patent is as well. It's been 20 years, so the patent is probably expired by now. Hmm. So, so patents only last. Uh, you can only keep a patent for. So it's definitely Disney. expired. <laughs> but but I'm sure that somebody else has come up with a new patent since then. But yeah, the PS3 controller that uh, was in question here was the six X controller. That's what they called it, and that was the one that the PS3 launched with and anybody who uh, bought oh what was that terrible game Factor 5 release where you rode the where you were controlling a dragon and you were supposed to use Ooh. the motion controls of the controller to control the dragon I, I know I know what you mean because it was actually quite a decent game but <laughs> the motion controls were controls terrible. killed it yeah and actually there is a afterwards they released a patch for that game I, I, why can't I remember that game and the name of the game but they released release a patch so you can play it with your controller if I can remember it correctly and actually when you buy it now and put it in your PlayStation 3 I think you will be having a great time but uh, yeah that 6 axis controller was just another gimmick again and uh, but have well, you ever played Flower? Uh, I mean they couldn't put the vibration so they, so had, they had to, to do, do something, something. Else. yeah but it's not the same no and at the time they were uh, when they do launch the PS3 in, t- in 06 they're going to claim that the reason they don't have the vibration in there is that it would interfere with the motion control uh, that's okay. going to be their excuse uh, so <laughs> but, but the reality is yeah, because, because they I still also have the stupid loss yeah i also have the, the controller with the rumble and the six axis so uh the dual shock 3 i think it's called uh, yeah and that was the later i mean once they once they settled this they could then release a proper uh controller but you know it took a while to get to that hmm. Okay, unfortunately okay. Lair Lair was the name of the game ah yeah yeah but I'm quite interesting to play that again <laughs> yeah I mean if, it's it's a bit like uh, Panzer the Room uh, maybe well I always considered it uh, from what I saw I mean I didn't play it for more than a couple minutes in a demo but it felt more like a Rogue Squad which was hmm. also from yeah, Factor, it's also 5. Factor 5 and that's a yeah. good game well and that's the thing I mean if it's if it was basically replicating that game mechanic but putting it into a setting where where you are, you know, flying a dragon. As somebody who is a massive fan of both Dragon Strike and Draken, the Draken series, uh, yeah, give me that. I want that all day long. But uh, I just don't think that it uh, it actually, you no. Know, I, I, I don't know. I'd have to see if it holds up with the normal control as opposed to what it was, quote unquote, intended. And we it's still kind of a shame that. because Factor 5 doesn't really last much longer after that due to the fact that Lair was a disaster and then their Superman 
game fell through. Mm, sad, because they made pretty awesome stuff. Oh, yeah, come on. Factor 5, Turrican, well, at least the Amiga port the Turrican. Uh, uh-huh. they, yeah, they were a great studio. The Rogue Squadron uh, 1 is still one of my favorite all-time games. So. Do we still <gasps> have a PlayStation 3? <laughs> do, we, do you? Or do no, you? no, I never owned uh-huh. a PlayStation 3. Or else you could uh, buy I still a, have a an copy Xbox of Lair. 360 CD, but that was the last console I had bought. Mm. I haven't had time to play. It's it's one of those things where uh, I was thinking of buying a PS3, kept putting it off because I didn't have time to play. I actually still have a couple of 360 games I need to get to. And then suddenly the PS4 and Xbox Series X were out, and I was like, or Series S, I was like, oh, okay, I guess I missed that generation. Mm, yeah. And I still just don't have time to play. It's very soon. If I made time, I wouldn't have time to invest 10 plus hours of researching the show. True. That's, and, uh, this is a lot of work and editing. Uh, uh, yeah. And the problem is, or I sh- should say, it's not really a problem. Uh, I honestly get more joy out of this than playing most games. Mm, yeah. Like, I don't have the sense of fulfillment at the end. I also that have, I have from that doing I the show. didn't game and just did cycling or something or another hobby and or stuff which were game related. And yeah, it's just like, if your interest shifts, then, then uh, why not? Why If you ha- get more joy out of other things, why don't do that? So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I still game a little bit here and there. It's just, and I'd love to sit down and play through another Assassin's Creed, but uh, every time I try to do that, I get this, and I'm sorry, everybody, we're completely going off the rails <laughs> from what you actually came here for, but, you know, hey, why not? It's one of those things where I start getting this feeling like I could be working on the podcast. So I've, I've got this weird feeling that after I'm done with the podcast, once I've got the 10 years in, we're closing in on year four being completed. Once I've got the 10 years in, that's when I'm going to sit back and I'm finally going to play G. <laughs> Uh, no, yeah. GTA 5, GTA 5. Probably there is maybe a GTA 6 or that around the oh, time. Oh, please, come on. <laughs> At the glacial pace that those games are being released, we'll That's be true. lucky yeah. if GTA 6 is by so. Yeah, I also have a really crazy back catalog, with uh, which I still have to play uh, from all years, from uh, from the NES to I have paid PS4, I have a new PC. There uh, there's too much to play, but uh, it's fun. It, it is, it, it's, <laughs> it's fun, and you know what, you get around to it when you get around. It, it, it feels like sometimes it feels like uh, a bit like when, when when my wife's back home uh, from work and I'm, I've been playing games all day then I feel a bit <laughs> ashamed that I was doing nothing right yeah it's like somehow uh, it's different than watching TV because people can watch TV all day and then it's not a problem maybe but <laughs> I don't know no 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 yeah, I'm sorry if you're sitting there watching TV all day it is a problem it's a big problem <laughs> but gaming I game well see this is the thing with gaming is you know it it's it's interaction and so forth but and i love it and i did so much of it as a kid and as a younger man but i i need this feeling of i need to have a finished product at the end that i can show and say i made this mm. and i don't get that from i can see it, that. if that yeah. makes yeah, yeah absolutely know? okay and so <laughs> i i like my little snippets of gaming like i'll you know i if i work for like two three hours and my eyes start to bleed or something i will turn on a digi- a computer pinball game or I'll fire up MAME and play some Super Pang or something for, to just bring myself down again but uh, it's not something that I go out of my way to spend large amounts of time yeah. uh, maybe when we are uh, in the retirement home then, uh, there you go there you go when we're Perfectly. old and gray we're going to be sitting there going I remember back in my <laughs> day you had to use your hands and your fingers to control the game you didn't just have to use your mind <laughs> What's all that about? Okay, so now, <laughs> okay, let's move on. We've let's got tons on. of stories left. What is this? Miyamoto. Okay, let's get to Nintendo. Miyamoto shows off Mario Sunshine in London. With the European GameCube launch approaching and the second wave of software getting ready for release, Nintendo turned out its biggest gun, Shigeru Miyamoto, for a press conference in London. Beside footage of Mario Sunshine demonstrating the new water cannon mechanic, he also demonstrated demoed footage of Metroid Prime, Star Fox Adventures,
Wars and Eternal Darkness, hinted that Sonic might show up in Mario Kart and that they would not support broadband since they just wouldn't apply to enough consumers. You just listed some beggars of games. It's crazy. Like, um, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a couple of them in there. I mean, Mario Sunshine, I tried playing it. Granted, I was never a big Mario fan to begin with, but yeah, Mario Sunshine wasn't really my cup of tea. Uh, and Star it's, Fox Adventures, also not really what I was expecting. But yeah, Metroid Prime. really great, in, especially in retrospect. If you play Mario Sunshine now, it's a really nice looking game. It controls well. It, uh, uh, it plays well. It, it's, it sounds great. Uh, I played it like two years ago ago and it's a really great game uh, back in the day when i first started it, it was just like this isn't mario maybe <laughs> maybe uh, yeah it's maybe like the difference was, was a bit too much for other people maybe yeah it, it diverged too far from the from the tried and true mario model yeah but it's a really great game and metroid prime is, is crazy good still today um Mar- uh, star fox Avenger, yeah it's not star fox that's the problem it because it was never intended to be a star fox game right and and Eternal Darkness is also a great game. So that that is a crazy good show uh, in London the back there. Back there. Yeah. The only problem is some of these games are still a few years out. Yeah, but who cares? You 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 get hyped. Well, you yeah, get hyped. but you have to remember if you're a retailer and you're using up the very precious space in your store for GameCube and the new games are coming in at a trickle, hmm. you could be moving more merchandise by putting something else in that spot. That's true, and I think this is. Europe, so GameCube was just out, I think, and not out yet. It's oh, still not coming. Yet. End of this the year. is before the European launch. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, and yeah. in Europe, it only launched with still maybe Luigi's Mansion or something. It, it didn't have and a Loki lot Ball. of games at launch. No. Uh, and this is something I'd have to look up. One sec. GameCube European launch games. Let's see. Okay. So, oh yeah, this is not necessarily a great lineup from at least from the first <laughs> titles I'm saying. So so the Japanese launch was bare bone. That was Luigi's Mansion, Super Monkey Ball, and Wave Race. The Wave American Race launch cool. had Batman Vengeance, All-Star Baseball 2002, Crazy Taxi, Dave Mira Freestyle BMX2, Disney's Tarzan Untamed, Madden NFL 2002, NHL Hits 2002, Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2, and Tony Hawk Pro Skate. Hmm, in addition to the Japanese titles. Okay, yeah, a lot of sports games. Yeah, and the and the European launch well, 2002 FIFA, Bloody Roar, Primal Fury, decent fighting game. Burnout, excellent game. Cell Damage, not such an excellent <laughs> game. Donald Duck Quack Attack, definitely not a great game. <laughs> uh, Driven, also not a great game. That's F1 simulator based off of a Stallone. ESPN International Winter Sports, you already know it from the title. Extreme G3, that's a futuristic racing game, has its fan. Yeah. International Superstar Soccer 2, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, okay, that's that one brought some people in, and Universal Studios Theme Parks Adventure. So, so that and that's a classic crap. So yeah, that's still not a great. Yeah, a lot of sports games that w- it gets a lot of people in uh, most of the time. I, I, I'm surprised the Monkey Ball isn't in there. I thought that no, that no, was a launch uh, the game. three Japanese launch titles are available in all three. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so you yeah. still have Luigi's Mansion, Super Monkey Ball, and Wave Race Loo Store. Yeah, I think Monkey Ball is the, one of the best released game. Of, oh yeah, of GameCube. So yeah, Monkey Ball. I mean. Hard as balls, but uh, <laughs> Super Monkey Ball is still, you know, absolute stone cold classic. Luigi's Mansion is something you also have to get used to. It's just like Mario Sunshine, a a game you have to get used to. Mm. But the interesting thing here is that this show is that the the Mario footage people had seen so far didn't include the water king. So this mm. is the first time people are seeing the water king. And what was the response? Uh, I, my my recollection, because I remember hearing about this show back in the day and and seeing the first images going what the f mm. and and that was pretty much as far as i remember the uh, everybody's reaction was is it what what is going on here because you have to remember we just had luigi's mansion where it's luigi yeah. with a backpack that he points at stuff and sucks stuff now mario's got a backpack that he points stuff at it was like uh, what's going men, on what? mess up. <laughs> why are the guys who used to be able to jump on stuff and kill everything and move and move through the world suddenly everybody needs a backpack mm. 
Yeah, I can see and that. And it did come off as a little weird, you know? Yeah, so uh, that's disappointing. I think a lot of those things came from like tech demos or something like, oh, the water effects are cool on the system. Uh, let's do a lot of water effects. And, the water effect and is there. The Everything covered with mud or whatever it was also is an things, effect yeah. you can pull <laughs> off now. So, yeah, they're trying to show off some of the technology stuff, uh, but it's, it's not necessarily going to make for memorable games. Game. Yeah. And here's another interesting little tidbit in the from this Edge article about this show that she, Shigeru Miyamoto explains that Japanese developers are hurting because they want to create realistic graphics. This is why the oh. Japanese developers are starting to fall behind the Western developers. And the GameCube's proprietary smaller discs that don't give you all the space of a DVD is a way of telling those developers that they don't have to make realistic looking games. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it was also, I think, around that time that the Japanese developers really wanted to be more Western-like, uh, like make stuff especially appealing to the US or something. And that wasn't a really great time for Japanese game development fell a bit because they tried too hard to, to make um, their stuff look like a game which came out in the US or something. It's like Well, yeah, there's they... a couple of facts. Number one, the Japanese economy is tanking. Oh. I mean, tanking hard, which also means that the Japanese consumer no longer has same kind of money to spend, which is one of the reasons why the GBA has taken off the way it has, because that's the cheaper alternative for games. Oh. Uh, the other problem with the Japanese developers is that the methodologies that the Japanese developers started um, using, like, you know, having dedicated designers and dedicated graphic art and so forth, which were resources that the Western developers just didn't have available to them or they weren't using because of higher wages and the and the fit, quicker turnover that the games required, especially on computer platform. And those have now become standardized in the Western industry. So this is why we see companies like Ocean, for example, disappear, and a lot of the European developers from the 80s and early 90s disappear because they didn't have that culture of, you know, refined game development. Yeah. But now you're seeing the rise of companies like Ubisoft and Infogram, which have more more of a tradition of artistic merit going into the games, which is really going to pay off in the long run. And the sports titles, um, the iter iterative uh, nature of the sports titles from companies like EA are also beginning to really pay benefits. They've been doing it for 10 years. So the idea of slowly refining a game design as a process, as opposed to saying it has to be out in six months and that's it, which was also the key to people, designers like Sid Meier, uh, oh. are now beginning to become realistic uh, options for Western developers. They're getting they're getting into that side of it. So even though they don't have the same aesthetic as the Japanese game developers, as long as they and they don't have the same design philosophies, that extra time and effort put into the game development is finally being realized in the West. And that's why the Western games are also uh, not over taking the Japanese developers, but they're really giving the Japanese developers a run for their money. Yeah, and they they got stressed about it, I think. Oh, well, they're getting stressed about it partially because the, a lot of the old franchises just aren't performing the way they used to because you need some new game designs, especially for these newer systems. And the other problem is also that Shigeru Miyamoto is basically just trying to spin the fact that Nintendo has less space as a pause. Uh, he's also and Nintendo is going to grow greatly promote the fact that Capcom is going to release Resident Evil Zero on the game, which is the super realistic looking remake of Resident Evil 1. Oh. And he's not, they're not going to complain that it looks realistic, not for a nanosecond, because they're just happy to have the game. Uh, but yeah, this is basically just Miyamoto. Miyamoto in interviews can come off sometimes as a bit of a blowhard. <laughs> now granted, if you're Miyamoto and you have made as many successful games Miyamoto has made, you have earned that right, but that doesn't change the fact that he can be a blow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's unfortunate that, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I feel the GameCube was an amazing system. But, yeah. Maybe I'm just a Nintendo guy. So <laughs> maybe I'm just like, uh, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe I feel I'm just a fanboy, but I feel it was, it had such nice gems on there. And, mm. uh, it's sort of not, not really filled, but it wasn't a and great Ethan success either. And love me for saying this. He knows what I'm about to say. The GameCube had a crap 
crappy ass controller that made it look like a toy and it, it felt like, like a, a toy, toy in the hands of an adult true but or a man with real hair. <laughs> uh, and I the problem the is it wasn't even it didn't have enough storage space for those bigger yeah. more elaborate games yeah. Uh, yeah. and uh, if you look at GTA 3 very quickly right after release of the game they already announced there's going to be an Xbox version and they also announced and we talked about this on the show that there was not going to be a GameCube version and yeah. I've looked on forums and there's people who have argued well the pl- the PC version they managed to compress it down and it could have fit yeah but that compression came at the cost of having to um, do real time decompression of the audio yeah. file for the, te- yeah. for the radio station it's a lot of computer power that's a lot of computer power mm. uh, they, they hampered themselves because they were so worried about piracy the same reason why the N64 was cartridge based as opposed to disc based and why so many games never appeared on it why Final Fantasy 7 ended up on the PlayStation and it's not until they get to the Wii that they've finally left that concern behind but also by the time they get to the Wii they're so far behind technology wise with the next generation of Sony's and Microsoft's that you know they're not competing for the same games anymore, which is fine I mean Nintendo is doing its own thing and they have an amazing design philosophy and everything is cool but if you wanted to play GTA uh, GTA it wasn't going to be on a Nintendo platform yeah, and it was the most popular game in that year so <laughs> it's still the most sold game every uh, year yeah, it's like that's come on so, speaking about consoles going online... Sony launches PlayStation BB. Not wanting to cede any ground to Microsoft, Sony has announced that PlayStation BB, a software that will allow users to surf web pages for games, download images, music, and even stream video of a real player using the Sony PS2 hard drive, is going to be hitting the market. The idea of using the PS2 as a workstation may give the system a new market to conquer. I I never heard of this thing. Uh, that's because uh, it releases in April in Japan. Supposedly, there's going to be a U.S. release in August that never happened, and forget about the European. Huh. Yeah, so yeah, basically, so <laughs> yeah. Now, from the very get-go, there was talk about the PlayStation being able to run Unix or Linux, and this is sort of an in-between where it's turning it into a web browser, and in theory, you could start doing productivity stuff. We also talked last month about how they released a printer for it oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah the problem is once you buy the hard drive add-on once you deal with the limitations of the system I the fact is every, at this point everybody has a it yeah. and we've talked about how we just came out of the dot-com pc prices for very basic models that can surf the web and stuff already came down in price so dramatic that everybody's got a pc at home the last thing you want to do is stare at at your TV set, which has a much lower refresh rate than a computer yeah. monitor, has a much lower resolution than the uh, than the computer monitor, and is Leading just from not, a CRT. Yeah, from a CRT yeah. TV. That's, that's exactly. kidding. It's that's... not what you want to be surfing the web, no. okay? <laughs> and that's why, if you're going to be hooking a PlayStation 2 up to a computer monitor, what's the point at that point, you know? Yeah, just just buy a PC or... Yeah. Or, yeah. But, you know, it's, Microsoft it's, is, you know, maybe in internet Japan, ready. Microsoft's right. machine is internet ready out of the box. It's yeah. got high speed jack right on the box uh, in the machine. And Sony is really worried about it at this point. They really don't know if Microsoft can pull up the upset. Here. Yeah. And uh, that's why they're going to do what Nintendo did 10 years earlier constantly, you know, be announcing new products that are designed to make sure that consumers will be like, well, okay, I'll wait to see what Sony does does as opposed to go out and buy the uh the competition machine yeah yeah they're, they're just uh, grasping uh, in the air and hope. yeah i mean yeah it's but hey they're still going to own the ps2 generation it's just the next one is when microsoft's going to come into its own yeah yeah that's obvious but uh yeah uh the the, the i don't know that this idea of having internet on your console it also is a bit gone now i think because i don't use my console to you to watch netflix or something 
don't think maybe other people do that. But Well, you don't need it nowadays because it's all built into the TV. But I bought my first Xbox 360 specifically for that reason. Yeah, that was I remember I also, I, bought it. I also bought my PS3 for Blu-ray disc, I think, or partly. Yeah. Like, well, no, but I literally bought the 360 because I wanted to be able to stream Netflix and ESPN3 on my television set. Mm, yeah. Even even in Germany? Uh, no, this was in the States. Ah, yeah. Because that wasn't a thing here. Netflix no, it like, wasn't a thing here yet. Uh, it's almost, uh, maybe it's five years here in, the, in Europe or something. But. Yeah, it's more than that. It's more than that. But yeah, it took a while longer because of, uh, we've talked about this on the show in the past, the way that telephone lines were and cable lines were regulated in Europe really prevented most countries from having high speed internet for a long time. Mm. In the States, you had dial up very early on and then the ubiquity of cable television just spurred on a massive uptick in high speed internet, at least at the beginning. Now there's there are some discrepancies today. But uh yeah, no, that that history, that regulatory history really did change the uh, the foundations of it. But the three sixty was the cheapest option for me to do it. Up until that point I had a tiny little PC that I had hooked up to my TV, but it was a pain in the butt because you know I'd have to boot it up, then I'd have to, you know, get the wireless keyboard out and a wireless mouse and from my couch have to move everything around on the screen to, you know, open up a web browser yeah. and then go to the address and try to launch stuff. It was a night. I remember having Windows Media Center or something like that. <laughs> with, um, uh, the Xbox. No, 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 there was a Windows oh, special yeah. Windows oh, yeah. thing and I hooked it up on my TV with cable through all through the house and with a, um, I had a really weird remote with work only half of the time. And exactly. It was a pain, yeah. And this is why. Uh, I had a separate TV behind the TV to do this, but it was still a huge, huge uh, inconvenience. Plugged in the Xbox 360, installed the Net- Netflix app, installed the ESPN app, and I was watching soccer games. I was streaming movies. Uh, I didn't care. And yeah. nowadays, obviously, that's all built into the smart TVs because they all have processors of the same or greater uh, capability than the 360 had at the time. But when I got my 360, it was already several years old at that point. That was easy. Okay. Well, mm-hmm. let's continue with the next story. Oh, yeah. Uh, Idols brings the Japanese weirdness to the West. Idols has launched a new label, Fresh Game, to publish less mainstream Japanese titles in the West. Will audiences jump on RPGs like Legaya 2 and oddball games like Mad Maestro and Mr. Mosquito? I never heard of these games, this so probably <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, they did. Uh, now, the Japanese, uh, we've like we mentioned, you know, they've got their own game design mechanics, and there's a whole bunch of cultural differences that allow for certain types of game designs to be acceptable and things that people will jump on board and try and that won't necessarily work in the West. Uh, Mr. Mosquito is one where you fly around as a mosquito in this room and you try to, you know, suck blood from people. Sounds Interesting little concept, uh, but I don't think the game had longevity. So it was a fun concept while the novelty lasted, but that was it. Mad Maestro was sort of a rhythm game, if I remember correctly. And of course, La Gaia 2 was one of the big RPGs, but those have been waning in popularity over the last years. At this point. They're either too, too late or uh, they're too soon, because I think nowadays it will work, but uh, and, and maybe before it worked as well, because the RPGs were big before. And, uh, yeah, yeah, the RPGs, they're too late to the game for that one, uh, and these oddball games would work as download titles at budget prices nowadays. Yeah, but not on full price. But yeah, but here we're still dealing with an age when you have to buy them in the store and there's only so low you can go. Mm, uh, because you have to print the price. disc and stuff, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, uh, for the sto- a store owner, the budget game takes up just as much room as the full price game. So either you're moving a whole bunch of them or you're not 
stocking because mm. it's eating up too much room. You're not going to have the same kind of budget for advertising because you're not making the same money off of it. And if you do have to charge almost the same price, the full price t- a game, and this is also coming at the time when these are all PlayStation 2 titles. This is also coming at the same time that Sony has announced their Platinum series. We talked about that a couple months ago. So they're reissuing successful games from first generation of PlayStation 2 software at like 20 bucks, 30 bucks. Uh, so even if you're coming in with a game like Mr. Mosquito as a budget game, you're going up against really, really good games that are at the same price. And also, I think the PlayStation 2 already had a crazy big library at that point. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, it's it's not that big because there was a lull that first year. Oh, okay. So the PlayStation 2 has a relatively big library, but it's not the massive drowning in games library that we think of today when we think of the PS2. Yeah, That's so, still going to come. And these games are probably really expensive now if you want them. They're probably not cheap just because because they are so relatively rare. rare. Yeah. Uh, speaking of rare stuff, <laughs> <laughs> Capcom debuted Steel Battalion controller. The ultimate mech game controller. The 40 butt pack in controller for Techie, or Steel Battalion as it was known in the West, consists of two joysticks, foot pedals, and dozens of buttons, including an eject button that has a small, clear plastic seat cover. This was a sight to behold. I, have you ever used one? No, I've never seen it either, but on uh, pictures, okay. I, I, know, I know what it is. Is, but, uh, There's a retro event near me every year, the Lange Nacht der Computer, Long Night of Computer, where uh, they take over uh, several stories of a technical school and turn them into an interactive uh, computer and video game museum. And a whole bunch of people bring in their collections and set them up so people can play games all night. And one of the games is Steel Battalion. So I have played Steel Battalion with the Steel Battalion <laughs> controller. Is it is it easy or is it? Oh, it's a fucking night. <laughs> it, it is just a nightmare. I had no idea what the hell I was doing. I'm walking around with the mech just trying to figure out what's going on. And I just kept getting the hell blown out. So, yes, uh, it is a game for connoisseur. You yeah. really have to get into it. I've heard great things about it once you get the hang of it. But it's you definitely a simulation have to get the hang game. Of it. It's basically a simulation game. Yeah, I mean, it's of it's a mech sim. Yeah. It's, a, it's a mech. It, it's your typical first person mech game yeah but it's more like uh, uh, a flight sim like uh, well, but, but with yeah. fantasy well machines. it's a fantasy setup but yeah it's trying to immerse you in the idea that this thing is real uh, the view that you have from the cockpit is very stylized so it almost feels like you're watching it through a computer monitor so it, it it's not you know your clean polygons like you would normally expect it makes it almost look like you're looking through some kind of infrared goggles or something. Hmm. Yeah, uh, it looks really impressive. There was a 360 game as well. No, uh, no, it, this is regular Xbox. Yeah, Xbox game. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I hope to see it uh, in real life for one day. But uh, what, one of these days, you'll have to come down. I've been t- I get, trying to get Mads down here for years to go to vent. Uh, maybe we can do a live recording of the show or something there. I was oh, going to try to cool. do it this year, but my kid got sick. Hmm. So uh, maybe next year, and that would be that would be a fun little uh, fun little fun. outing. Yeah. It would be fun. Great yeah. idea. Okay, moving on. <laughs> PC game boxes aren't that yet. After EA decided to move to DVD boxes in the USA following similar moves in Europe, German publisher Joe Wood is launching a new DVD-sized cardboard box packaging that will have a flap in front and be twice as thick as a DVD box, allowing for more promotional shots and text to help sell the games, as well as include manual. Ubisoft will be following suit with their, lo- their launch of Bethesda does Morrow. I remember these boxes. They're like mm. yeah, DVD boxes but in cardboard and a little bit thicker. Yeah. And you can fold them open and maybe the discs were left and right or something. Well, usually what they would have, I mean, there were a lot of variations, but usually you would just have a very thin flap, like one piece of cardboard flap on the front that would open up and just show you a bunch of screenshots of the game and so oh, forth. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what this did was, on the old boxes, you know, you could have a dozen screenshots screenshots on the back with a bunch of text obviously with the whole box smaller and you still have to have all the tech specs and stuff on the box you can't put as much on the back so this actually gave you almost more real estate than the old games had uh the old simple cardboard boxes and then on the inside
had the extra width allowed you to throw in a manual if you needed it. But it's still not the same as a real No, big it's box. still not an, an old school big box. I mean that that that's something that you never But you know, it's it's better than a kick. <laughs> that's the way to look. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sticking with PC game. Okay, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, but uh, Canucks. Ca- ca- Canucks. Canucks are trying to bring games to Linux. Yeah, Canucks is a sort of derogatory term for kids. We love you guys, okay? Uh, Canadians, we love you. Uh, Gabriel State, with a V, CEO of Canadian-based Trans Gaming Technologies, Inc., thinks that the lack of Linux's success on desktop machines is due to the lack of game. He aims to fix this by marketing emulation software that will allow Windows games to run under Linux. Their product, WineX, is to act as an in-between layer between the program and the OS. Their success rate is not always that good, especially because those pesky programmers keep exploiting holes in systems like DirectX to get their games to run better. This sounds like a headache. I can remember trying Linux at, I think, around that time, and it was even really hard to even get your video drivers running and stuff. Yeah. So I don't think you will get people to Linux with games because you really have to be tech-savvy to get it even running. And the Wine, uh, is it still the, the Wine we Wine X. I still use Wine on my Mac sometimes to Well, emulate. because your Mac is just a Linux box. Yeah, but is that the same product? Yes, yeah, yes. it's the same product. It's, so it's, it's still... an evolution of it. They end up selling the product to NVIDIA. So NVIDIA is the one that continued to develop it. They sold that in 2015. Yeah, because nowadays, I think, I haven't tried Linux uh, in a long while, but I think it's in a way better state now. Uh, if but... you have a Mac, you're using Linux. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's let's not kid ourselves. <laughs> you're using, <laughs> well, you, you're using a Unix. B- BSD, yeah. Yeah, but... the Mac OS has been dead for 20 years, so let's, let's, let's not pretend it's still a Mac. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I think this probably didn't bring a lot of gamers to Linux. But... No, no. I mean, uh, this is around the same time when uh, the webcomic PvP was making jokes. Uh, their, their one kid character, the, the FPS ca- character, I can't remember what his name, uh, the younger kid in the office had gone Linux crazy and then he's, he's standing at line at this show and he's listening to these two Linux guys talk about how, you know, oh, they're, they are running Age of Empires at this great speed. Now, if he could just get the sound driver to work. And the <laughs> other guy's like, yeah, and it runs so fast on my machine. Now, if I could just get the resolution to, uh, to go beyond 640 by 480. And the guy's like, you know what? If if I was running it without sound and at 640 by 480, my PC would run it really fast too. <laughs> and and this is the problem. Uh, you, you can diss on a big operating system like Windows all you want. But the fact that virtually everything simply works, given the myriad of hardware configurations that are possible, yeah, yeah. it's as good as it's going to probably get. And uh, I, I do yeah, I do like where the guy's thinking. I mean, he's saying, you know, if there were games, people would use this. And that's true. An operating system without games is never going to have any kind of market management. Like Mac OS? Exactly. <laughs> well, if you go to uh, some kind of uh, internet coffee or like a, a coffee coffee shop or something, everybody has a uh, Yeah, because has, uh, they don't want you playing games on there. They're trying to dissuade you from playing games. Yeah, but yeah, so people buy <laughs> Mac. But well, you buy games. Macs because you don't want people to play games. <laughs> uh, for for your for your company, you mean? Like when nobody you... buys Macs for a company. Come on. <laughs> okay, well, the graphic, uh, working graphic design. Yeah, so... <laughs> but you tell me, there's an accounting department someplace that's no, using Macs, no, please. No, please. No, probably. And even I uh, had to um, beg for a Mac uh, at most places I worked, and I do a lot of graphic design. So there you go. And because let's face it, you don't freaking need it. At least not at those at those prices. Um, right. But okay, I've I've done my tirades on the Mac before. I will let that be. <laughs> just like just like let's move week. on. Let's move on. <laughs> EverQuest wants to make you a legend. Yes, MMO juggernaut EverQuest has announced a new exclusive server, the Legend Server. This premium priced, aka forty dollars a month, limited to just eight thousand player server, will offer much greater swag and an exclusive 
sensitive territory. The extra price promises to help finance a dedicated support team for the server, something that many of the normal $9.99 a month servers have complained was lacking. Whoa, that's a really costly thing, 40 bucks a month. Oh, yes, but you got extra swag. You got extra weapon treasures, and basically it was played. Yeah, and uh, also a lot of people just, yeah, 8,000 players. It was limited to 8,000 players, so it's also like a FOMO thing. And, uh, oh, yeah. And also rich boys, like 40 bucks is yeah. nothing. So 40 bucks a month like, is nothing, and you it, you get a concierge-type service because you have your own tech support. You don't have to wait for regular tech support. <laughs> Did yeah. you ever need it for EverQuest? Oh, Never yeah. Played. I mean, there was stuff breaking the time and stuff. I mean, anytime you have these uh, these ongoing worlds, there's always stuff falling apart. Mm. Uh, and that is just one of those things. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a moment. There's a lot of worlds popping up everywhere, and a lot of them still requiring a lot of mate. And uh, But, you know, EverQuest is going to keep this going all the way up until 2006. That's when they're finally going to shut down the Legend server. Mm. So it, it lasts it, four years. And, and EverQuest itself, does it still exist? Oh, yeah. EverQuest 1 and EverQuest 2 are both still running. Oh, oh yeah, it, killing an MMO, not that easy once you really have everybody going because at a certain point yeah, the people system, invested an insane amount of money and time in it. Yeah. You've invested an insane amount of money and time. The community has invested an insane amount of time in it. And what ends up happening is that the cost of running the server decreases every year. That's true, yeah. Because, I mean, you designed this thing to require a certain amount of bandwidth. Well, as bandwidth gets cheaper, running the server gets cheap. You designed it with a certain level of graphic, meaning you need a certain number of processes on the server. Well, server calculation speed increases, but the need for more stuff doesn't. So yeah, there's there are some huge, huge advantages to that. So yeah, EverQuest 1 and 2 are both still running. Oh, okay, well, speaking of EverQuest, EverQuest Dev leave Sony. Brad McQuaid and Jeff Butler, two of the luminaries behind EverQuest, have left Sony Online to form a new MMO developer, Sigil Games Online. In 2007, they would launch Vanguard Saga of Heroes and then sell the company right back to Sony. <laughs> and then Vanguard Saga of Heroes flop. I never heard of it. Uh, I I never heard of it either, uh, and I don't know if it's still running. That's actually something we look up right now. Can you play Vanguard Saga of Heroes as we speak? Let's see. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Vanguard. Uh, well, the Wikipedia entry is written in the simple past tense. Was a high fantasy <laughs> game. Uh, let's see. Game was released January 30th, 2007. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see, when was it shut down? Oh, using the Unreal Engine 2. Okay, in July 2008. Okay, da, 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 da. Oh, game was officially shut down July 31st, 2014. Oh, still seven years. Yeah, that's not too shabby. No, and then I mean, there were a lot of MMOs uh, getting out at that time. Oh, yeah, there were and, so many of them at this point in time. It's and you can only play one, so... And, yeah, you and can we, only play one at a time. Yeah, and we all know uh, which one uh, eventually <laughs> everyone played. Well, at this point, your WoW doesn't exist. No, but it's coming. It's coming. The <laughs> first screenshots have come out, but it's still going to be a couple of years before WoW hits. WoW doesn't come out until 03 or 04. 04. Mm, okay, so two years left. Yeah, we got two years left before WoW takes over the world. But also, nobody, you couldn't be 100 percent sure that WoW was actually going to be that important. But uh, yeah. Yeah, and nobody ever thought EverQuest was going to fail, but then EverQuest 2 kind of failed. So, uh. <laughs> okay, okay. Speaking of more MMOs, players to Mythic over sale of MMO items. There you go. <laughs> A group of Dark Age of Camelot players has sued Mythic Entertainment over their policy that prohibits the sale of in-game items outside of the game. Uh, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm a bit... Uh, uh... So, Mythic Entertainment made an MMO called Dark Age of Camelot. And they have a policy that says you're not allowed to sell items that you gained or earned in the game to other players for real money. Okay. And this has become a bigger and bigger deal. Uh, another story this month is 
uh, concerning BlizzardsBattle.net, which was their online infrastructure for games. And Diablo 2 uh, had a bug in the code where if you jump in and out of the game very quickly, uh, what would happen is Battle.net, the server side, would get confused and would duplicate items. So if you, if you, you know, you killed a monster and dropped an item, a valuable item, you could pick it up, immediately jump out of the system, and then jump back in, and the system would think that you hadn't picked it up, so you could pick it up again. And then you do this 20 times, and suddenly you have 20 copies of this item. I don't know and, Mark at this, uh, thinking about it because of it. Yeah, and Blizzard had set up an entire portal where people could buy and sell items from the game. Yeah, so, and that the value of those items uh, were... Exactly. They they just crashed the entire economy. Of it. If they only had a blockchain back then. Well, this is the thing. Each one of those items did have a server recorded number, so they could see that the same item was being sold multiple times. But they still couldn't stop it. Oh, they did. They did. They patched. Uh, yeah. It was a problem. Yeah. It collapsed the marketplace for a little while, and then they solved the problem, deleted the extras, and brought everything back. So, what's the story about Mythic? Well, Mythic is just saying we're not doing that, period. They're trying to be uh, pure as far as the experience, so they're tr- uh, they're saying we're not going to meta game here. You can't... Uh, what happens in the game stays, and the idea of you spend 50 hours in the game to earn an item and then you turn it into real-world cash was not what they wanted the the, the game experience to be about. And the, and the players did want it. The players did want it, but the thing is, those items in the game belong to Myth. They don't belong to you. Mm. Uh, and you're just, you know, you've bought a license to play this game and you can't then go ahead and uh, and go around it. Now, I don't know exactly what happened with this lawsuit, but there was another lawsuit by a uh, an item trading platform, a website that was allowing people to find buyers and stuff for their items a game, who, when they got their access shut down, sued uh, Mythic and then had to drop the lawsuit. And also I found an interesting blog post. The One of the creators of Dark Age of Camelot uh, has a new MMO uh, that they're running. And in part of one of his blog entries talks about uh, all the conflicts that they had back day with this and the fact that in his new MMO, you also will not be able to buy and sell the items outside of the game because he still thinks that it destroys the entire uh, flow of the game. Yeah, you get the pay to win stuff. If you, well, you get the pay to win. You get the people who are, you know, uh, gold farming or, you know, you hire somebody to level up your character for you and stuff like that, as opposed to really playing through the game's material, the, the game's uh, levels and everything else as they were intended to be played through. Uh, and so you're not really getting the game experience. It's kind of like what we talked about in our last episode going into an arcade where all the machines are set to free play and it's not fun. Mm. It, it lacks the excitement of, yeah. oh my god this is my last quarter and I desperately want to try to stay alive. Well, if you're playing this MMO and everything is easy because you somebody handed you a leveled up character, what's the point? <laughs> yeah, it remembers me of uh, me playing uh, World of Warcraft when it came out, or around the game, time it came out. I didn't want to pay for subscription there so there were like uh servers like russian servers or something where you can play it but everything was like sped up so you could level up really fast uh, and mm. <laughs> it was really not a fun game to exactly play like that. So, and this uh, is the thing game balancing this is what we were talking about earlier with the japanese developers having all these extra people there to make sure that the games are well designed and stuff that really tight game balance getting that flow right the amount of level leveling and which time frame and so forth that's an art form and you want to really enjoy a well-crafted game and the moment that you allow cheats and and ch- and changes and modifications to that the game designer no longer has control you're no longer playing what the game designer intended now you are basically just playing a hack version yeah, and especially and, online that's a big problem oh of course because if you're a single player you can destroy your game if you want. 
Well, and this is the question. I mean, it was the game designed to be played single player? I mean, if you're playing a game that was never meant to be played single player, then yeah, it's probably a feature, not a flaw. Then again, a game that was never designed to be played single player shouldn't be giving you the option to play single player to begin with. But that's <laughs> yeah. okay. We're almost through. So games are becoming hot movie properties. After the success of Resident Evil, which made $17 million in the U.S. on its opening weekend off of a budget of just $33 million, the Hollywood Reporter reveals that a sequel is already in the works. New Line Cinema of Lord of the Rings fame has announced that they are working on a state of emergency movie, and a Tekken movie will start filming in April for a 2005 release. There's also talk of a Halo movie. Yeah, they, those were all great movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, the Tekken movie won't show up until 2010. Uh, the DOA... Um, uh, movie will appear in 2006. The which is they may have just gotten this mixed up. Um, uh, so Dead or Alive was probably the movie that was going to start filming uh, for a 2005 release, but I could be wrong. And uh, State of Emergency is never going to show up because State of Emergency is not the GTA killer that they thought it was going to be. Uh, Halo will become a TV show in 2022, so obviously no movie in 2002. It's only 20 years later and. And the what I forgot, and I probably knew this at some point, but the guy who directed the first Resident Evil, and I think a couple of the sequels, uh, was a guy called Paul Anderson, and he also directed the original Mortal Kombat movie. That I forgot, and that was brought up in one of these articles. And I was like, oh my goodness! I, so, I, heard, I never seen the Resident Evil movies, but some people around me said that they were, they, they were decent. They're they're nothing like the games, but they are kind of okay action movies. Yeah. Yeah, the first one functions more as a prequel to the first game, so it's more of a setup of what the uh, Umbrella Corporation was doing and so forth, and I haven't seen them either, so I'm going completely off of what other people have told me. Uh, and there is a little bit more crossover with what has happened in the games later on in the movies, but yeah, they do take a lot of liberties with the story. Which is a good thing, maybe, because uh, video game stories aren't the best translated to movies, I think, so... Yeah, video game story often not so. So taking life. some liberties is maybe a good thing. Probably. Well, I mean, the Resident Evil uh, movie franchise is super, super, super successful. I mean, they're up to I think six or seven movies at this point, and uh, they've all made money. And they may not all be critically acclaimed, but they keep going. So hey, they're doing something but right. There's money somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, G4 Last launches. But not least. Yeah. Sorry. G4 launches. The world's first twenty. 24-hour cable network dedicated to games will be launched by cable company Comcast. The station would run until the end of 2014 before being shut down and then brought back in November of 2021. This is a thing from the U.S., I think. I, yes. I, I've seen stuff, G4 stuff, but uh, uh, you have to be, uh, you have to uh, explain Give some stuff. info here? Yeah. I never got to watch G4. It was not available uh, to me. At the time, I did not have Comcast. So as my uh, cable provider and the G4 channel was something I think I could have paid extra to get. But uh, yeah, the one thing I know is they had a couple of shows like Attack of the Show. Olivia Munn was the uh, was one of the people on that show. They also did some uh, good uh, documentary type things about, you know, the history of video games and the like. But for the most part, I know very little to nothing about G4 because I never got to. I wonder, 24 hours a day about video games. That's some, so it's probably really not great TV. Maybe some stuff was high production, but there's probably a lot of filler in there as well oh 99.9 uh, percent .9 filler i'm sure especially the beginning but you know you gotta start someplace but but what 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 were they bro broadcasting next to those documentaries and maybe the shows like people probably playing games? just people talking about game uh i honestly do not
not know. Uh, let's see. Can we find online what was their programming? I mean, schedule 2002. List of programs broadcast by G4. Uh, let's see. Former programming. Original. So let's see. Shows that they had. They had a show called Cinematech. Guessing movie stuff. Show called Game Makers. Probably about people who made games. G4TV.com. Players. Judgment Day. I mean, they've got some good names for shows. Players uh, is an American television program focused on video games that aired on G4. Uh, one of the launch programs, the main premise of the show was to interview famous celebrities and see if they played video games or not, what their favorite ones were, etc. The show was canceled in 04, still aired occasionally until 06. So people like Vin Diesel, Robin Williams, Asia Carrera, David Arquette, David Hoffman, Alec Baldwin, Chris Carmack, and Bare Naked Lady. Okay, I, I can <laughs> see myself watching that back in the day. Yeah, uh, it's maybe a bit like MTV or something like that. So like sometimes there's an interview and other, yeah. and other parts are just... Yeah, and then they got like new gameplay. shows. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, Cinematech was apparently a show where they looked at game trailers and the, and the like. Uh, let's see. Okay, and now here they had a show called Wired for Sex. Interesting. How the internet and technology have changed sex. Okay, I, I, I can <laughs> see the demographic that they're going for with that one. <laughs> Uh, let's see. They had a show called Cheat that was just about game strategies and cheat codes and other oh, hidden that, features in games. That would be a cool uh, show to, to watch now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, it it was what you would expect from a uh, from a channel uh, dedicated to uh, games. I'm, um, I'm not that familiar with channels dedicated to one thing. Uh, <laughs> in, in Europe, there were not that many channels. That's so. true. And in the states, it was a very common. thing thing to have i mean mtv which we had here in europe you know dedicated mm. to music uh you had news channel dedicated to uh history channel dedicated to history documentary stuff like that yeah we only had like maybe 10 channels and then uh, maybe a discovery channel from from outside and mm. uh, we had cartoon network and stuff but that's all later in my in my as a kid i never see, seen uh, specialty channels or something it was just uh yeah just uh, a mix of things yeah yeah. And, channel. and that happened. I'm also seeing that they bought up a bunch of uh, shows, a lot of reruns of old things like Robot Wars and Star Trek aired on there. And they also aired the Happy Tree Friends, which is awesome. Well, I miss Happy Tree Friends. <laughs> have you ever uh, seen that? Uh, yes, I think so. But I uh, don't have uh, a lot of memories of it. Yeah, it's uh, just uh, it was a series of web animations with these very cute characters. And at the end of each one, they would all die horribly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember a little, but <laughs> maybe yeah. Yeah, they, they are probably on YouTube. That's, that's, uh, oh, definitely. Feed. Yeah. That's our homework yeah. for next show. <laughs> okay. I think we are good then. This is end of the show. We have no more news. So, Vouter, what is the word of the episode? I'll go for weirdness. Weirdness. I love it. Okay, everybody. Remember, uh, you can check all our links in the show notes. Consider supporting us on Patreon to help us uh, keep the the bills down and uh until next time have fun bye